Okay, uh, today we're talking about sex, evolutionary, hormonal, and neural bases. Uh, and this is from chapter, this is chapter 12 in the textbook. I hope it's still chapter 12. Uh, anyway, okay, here we go. Uh, don't forget you've got a paper due. It can be on anything, um, anything in the text. So that, that covers just about everything. It's uh, a fairly general uh, idea, or it's a it's a fairly general text. It covers 17 different areas of psychology. So uh, that that includes just about anything. So it's due on the uh, at the beginning of November. Uh, you've got a couple weeks left until election day. That I think it's probably due on election day or the day before election day. Election day is the third. I hope everybody votes. Vote any way you like. Whatever you think is best. Uh, one of the reasons that uh, you have such a difficult time getting the uh, federal government to acknowledge uh, your needs is the fact that uh, American Indians vote uh, at, at a very low level. If you voted more frequently, if they uh, if you voted uh, uh, if they were aware that you voted, uh, then uh, they would have to listen to you and. That's that's true of the governor uh, of, of your state. Uh, that's also true of the federal government. Uh, if you become a voting power, then uh, the federal government will have to acknowledge uh, your needs, and they will try to get you to vote for them. And one of the ways they do that is by is by uh, acceding to your to your needs. Anyway, okay, so we're going to talk about sex, and the first thing we're going to talk about is how sex works. There are four stages of reproductive behavior, and when we're talking about the four stages of reproductive behavior, we're primarily talking about uh, mammals, but uh, we can also be talking, about, well, and humans, of course, are mammals. Um, so the first stage of, uh, of reproductive behavior is sexual attraction. Uh, in most species, sexual attraction cannot take place until the female is ready to reproduce, but that's not true in, in humans, of course. Uh, it's not true in, in primates. Uh, the only, or, but they are the only animals that have that. Uh, other animals like uh, cows and, and uh, horses, uh, sheep, uh, dogs, cats, uh, mice, whatever, uh, what other, other, whatever other fur furry beings you're talking about. Uh, the female has to be ready to reproduce before uh, any kind of sexual attraction takes place or any kind of sexual intercourse can potentially happen. This can be judged by whether males approach her and how rapidly they approach her. And if you've ever seen a, a dog or cat or horse or cow or sheep in heat, you understand what I'm talking about. Uh, the female will show attraction to the male by whether she allows him to approach. If she's not ready to reproduce yet, she's starting to put off... Uh, uh, pheromones, but she's not ready to reproduce. Spe this we see this especially in dogs. Uh, the uh, female dog will will attack the male dog and chase him away, uh, which doesn't. He but he doesn't go very far. He will uh, still uh, be around her, uh, and uh, maybe next time he won't get so close. Uh, but as soon as she's ready to reproduce, of course, she will allow him to approach her. If in many ma uh, mammalian species, a female will demonstrate her approachability through swelling in the vaginal area that is a different color and an odor regulated by a surge in the estrogen. Of course, this is the pheromone. Uh, in most species, intercourse is not possible without full female cooperation, and that is a reality. Uh, stage two is appetitive behavior, uh, behavior that establishes, maintains, or promotes sexual behavior. When a female is displaying this behavior, she may approach a male, she may stay close to the male, uh, she may uh, show alternating approach and retreat behavior, she may move in a specific manner that will result in the male mounting the female. This is known as proceptive uh, behavior. Male appetitive behavior uh, may consist of staying near and sniffing the female, a uh, weird thing happened to me uh, when I was in Germany. Uh, I went, <laughs> we, were, we were in Frankfurt, and everybody else went to the sex shows. <laughs> but instead of going to the sex shows, I didn't figure I needed to see two people having, two humans having sexual intercourse. I went to the, I went to the, the zoo instead. 
well, lucky me, the primates were were uh, were uh, reproducing, uh, and it was baboons uh, in this case. And it was really kind of interesting because uh, the females were ready to reproduce, and the male would stand there, and uh, they would walk around him, and he would grab them, and, and ha he would mount them. Uh, there wasn't much mounting going on. It was uh, he just pulled them toward him. Uh, is really kind of the oddest thing that you've ever seen. You pump them a couple of times and throw them off, and then they would just keep walking around. And there were five, four or five females. The Germans just went crazy about this because they didn't have to pay for it, I guess. Anyway, <laughs> the place was packed watching these baboons uh, reproduce. It was really the oddest thing in the world. But it was perceptive behavior. The uh, uh, the females were approaching the males. Um, and they just kept walking around him, and he would grab one of them, and, and uh, of course, they were receptive. It's not like he was doing anything they didn't want him to do, uh, and he would uh, he would breed with them. Male ap appetite behavior, okay, we already talked about that. Copulation or coitus, and of course, uh, they were having coitus. Um, they were copulating. Uh, copulation begins when the male puts his penis in the female's vagina, an act known as intromission. Uh, that's what was going on with the uh, with the male and female's baboons. Through rhythmic movements, uh, the male will then squirt sperm-filled semen into the female's reproductive tract. Uh, he, like I said, he was just he was moving them back back and forth a couple times, and then he was throwing he was kind of pushing them off. Um, I guess it only took that that many times and there were like I said there were four or five different females and he bred all of them uh, two or three times in turn he didn't breed the same one more than uh, you know right after the uh, right after he had already had intercourse with them it's really kind of kind of an uh, odd to watch these animals kind of walking around making figure eights around the male it's really kind of weird after copulation the two will go through a period when they will not be able to re-engage in intercourse this is known as a refractory phase. However, a male presented with another female uh, will show a shorter refractory phase. This is called a Coolidge effect, and that's what was going on with the uh, male baboon. Uh, since he was being approached by other females, he was able to uh, reproduce with that second or third or fourth or fifth female. Uh, where, where the Coolidge effect came from, it came from Calvin Coolidge. Uh, he was president of the United States in, in the 20s. Um, he was, uh, he went to a farm, <laughs> he went to a chicken farm, and uh, while he was there, there, uh, he was watching a rooster breeding with hens, and, uh, uh, and, and of course he would, he would, uh, mount uh, one of the hens, and, and then he would, uh, he would have intercourse with her, and then he would well, start strutting around, and he, then he would mount another female, and, uh, <laughs> Mrs. Coolidge said to Calvin, she said, look, see, see how he does that? And Calvin said, yeah, well, if I had my choice of all these hens, I, I, I could do that too. And it was a big joke, and it got into the newspapers, and everybody laughed because it had to do with animal husbandry. And, and uh, I, anyway, it, uh, it became known as the Coolidge effect, where a male can have intercourse with uh, a second or third female, and their refractory phase is much shorter. When a female is ready to copulate, she will be sexually receptive, of course, and that is how they know. And uh, they know by the odor, uh, and they know by the swelling in her vaginal region if she is a, an animal uh, other than a primate. Postcopulatory behavior is stage four. This is different in most species. The males of all uh, mammals but primates achieve and maintain their erections with a bone in their penis called an os penis. Os means bone, bone penis. Uh, sometimes, as with dogs, the male is unable to remove themselves from the copulatory position for minutes after ejaculation. So if you're looking at any other uh, animal like a horse or a hippopotamus or whatever, uh, as long as it's a mammal, uh, they probably have, they do have a, an os penis. Uh, the animal with the largest uh, bone in their penis is the walrus. 
uh, if I remember correctly. Uh, not that they talk about this very much. It's like, oh, this is a taboo subject we can't talk about. Uh, uh, we can't talk about how uh, hippopotamuses uh, uh, have intercourse. <clears throat> the whole purpose of copulation is the joining of the male and the female gametes, the ovum in the female and the sperm in the male. If the two join, the ova will become fertilized and the union will become a zygote. While all mammals, birds, and most reptiles fertilize inside the body, internal fertilization, fish and frogs fertilize outside the body, and that's known as external uh, fertilization. So, birds and most reptiles, uh, and mammals, birds, and most reptiles have internal fertilization, and fish and frogs fertilize outside the body, and that's known as external fertilization. If a species lays eggs outside the body, as birds and reptiles do, it is called oviparity, or egg birth. If the species allows a zygote to develop into the, in the female's body, it is referred to as viviparity, or live birth. For most creatures, there is only one sexual position they can be in for copulation to be possible. Since most mammals uh, walk on all fours and have a tail, reproduction can only take place if the female raises her rump and moves her tail to the side. Uh, this will usually straighten her vagina adequately for penetration to occur, and this is known as lordosis. And that's what this cat is in a position of lordosis. For frogs to mate successfully, the male must mount the female. There is no penetration. But as a female emits her unfertilized eggs, the male must release his sperm. Uh, if this does not take place in or over water, reproduction, of course, will not take place. This position is known as amplexus. So this is the position of amplexus. This is the position of lordosis. While sexual response is extremely complex, the female anatomy for intercourse is relatively simple. Two folds of skin cover the, and protect the vaginal opening. This is the labia, and we'll tell you where that comes from uh, at the end of the chapter. The female erectile tissue is the clitoris above the vaginal opening. So the clitoris and the penis are similar. Are, uh, they come from the same tissue. Uh, they are the erectile tissue. So the clitoris on the female and the penis of the male. Since male delivery of the gamete uh, requires penetration, the male system is more complex than that of the female. Erection takes place due to an engorgement of blood. Semen is produced in the testes and stored in the epididymis. During ejaculation, the sperm travels up the vas, vas deferens, past the seminal vesicle, prostate gland, and Cowper's gland, where it picks up a viscous alkaline fluid called semen. Now, in order for the female to, to protect herself, for her re reproductive area uh, to be protected, uh, it is it's very, very acidic. Uh, when she ovulates, however, uh, the acidity becomes more neutralized, uh, and it's, uh, it's uh, far less uh, acidic than it was before. But in order to neutralize the acidity so that the sperm can swim, uh, the male will produce a uh, alkaline uh, uh, substrate or semen. So the uh, semen is, is alkaline and the uh, vaginal tract is, uh, is uh, very acidic. Now the reason it's acidic is because it has to protect itself from bacteria. So the more acidic it is, the uh, less likely that the uh, bacteria will be able to grow uh, in that region. And that is to protect the female and the female reproductive area. If the female didn't have uh, an acidic uh, reproductive area, humans would have died out a long time ago due to uh, mass infections. Normally the male is not erect because cells in the glands of the penis, the paragigantocellular nucleus, send serotonergic fibers down the spinal cord that inhibit erection. So we have serotonin fibers are uh, fibers that uh, are sensitive to serotonin that run down the spinal cord, and that inhibits erection. Otherwise, men would walk around with uh, erections all the time. During sexual excitation, the fore, uh, forebrain inhibits the PGN and it allows the penis to become erect. And the uh, substance that, uh, that does this is a nitrous uh, substance nitrous oxide. 
It's the same stuff as laughing gas. SSRIs increase serotonin in the brain and may not allow the inhibition of the PGN. In other words, if the PGN is not inhibited, then uh, then uh, the individual will not be able to, to have an erection. While there is no normal or typical when it comes to sexual response, too many social and psychological factors, including taboos that you guys have, taboos that the people in the United States have that other people don't have. We're going to be talking about another group, uh, a, uh, a tribe in Africa, uh, who uh, the females are, until they get married, they can be as sexually promiscuous as they want, and it's not seen as anything negative. So it all has to do with uh, social and psychological factors that control uh, individuals' behavior. Uh, it was the same way on the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, the females on the Hawaiian Islands were not, uh, their sexuality was not regulated and therefore they, they could do whatever they wanted to do. Uh, and, and that was their society. That was, that was the way that they were raised. And that's one of the reasons, well, the, the, the hula and, and some of the other uh, dances that the, uh, that, uh, the Hawaiian, native Hawaiians uh, engaged in were, were very provocative. They were very um, uh, seductive. And the, one of the reasons was because uh, they don't have the same taboos that we have. But of course, just like everything else, Europeans, as soon as they got there, they, they decided that everybody had to be like them. So they changed, they changed their, uh, their, their social, uh, social control uh, to be more, more like Europeans. Um, Okay, well, we can, and we could talk about <laughs> this kind, these kinds of social taboos and psychological factors all day long, uh, and whether they make any sense or whether they don't make any sense. Uh, but the reality is, each society uh, makes their own uh, uh, regulations. They regulate the the, the sexuality uh, through their through their norms and taboos. And Europeans have done it. Uh, and if you go to Europe today and you watch television, uh, if you watch television in uh, Germany, uh, then uh, we used to see uh, nudity on the, on their from, on, on their advertisements. Same thing in Japan. We used to see uh, nudity in their uh, in their advertisements. Well, that's that's their social norm. Uh, if you go to the Netherlands, uh, this is way back in the 80s. If you go to the Netherlands and you turn on the television after 9 o'clock, it's mostly pornographic movies, as weird as that may seem, but that's just their social and psychological uh, uh, control of, of uh, what's, what's happening as far as males and females are concerned. I already told you that uh, in Germany, uh, Thursday night is nude swimming at the, at the Svimbad, the... Uh, the heated pool, uh, every, and <laughs> after World War II, uh, one of the things that uh, they did, they, re, they rebuilt all the, the, the towns, and usually they made a community center, and it had a, a swimming pool in it, and uh, of course, there's public swimming every day, I think there is every day, but Thursday was the day that if you wanted to, to swim nude, that you could swim nude in Germany, which was a little odd uh, for Americans, um, uh, and Americans could go, I mean, it really didn't mean anything. Um, I, I think I told you the story about my wife. Uh, she had just arrived in Germany, and she was, she was going from, uh, she was on the Audubon, and she was going from Zweibrücken to uh, Ramstein, and she got off, she got off, and there was a, a German, um, Concern a, a German fort there, uh, and the, these guys were had just gotten off the Audubon. Who knows how far they had traveled, but they they were they were in a troop troop uh, truck, and they all piled out and they start and then they all urinated on the side of the the road, and you know they just kind of did it, and of course that wouldn't be accept, accept, acceptable in the United States to see a whole raft of men urinating into the ditch uh, certainly would be uh, acceptable in, uh, in on the uh, Navajo Nation uh, for somebody to do something like that that would be that would be going against your taboos <clears throat> uh, what are we talking about well there is no normal or typical when it comes to sexual response women achieve vaginal lubrication 
during the excitement phase. Males have a smaller amount of lubricating exudate uh, during erection to ease penetration. Uh, males typically have uh, one basic pattern of response, but they do, do pass through a refractory phase after orgasm when erection is difficult. Females, however, rarely have a refractory phase, thus, um, thus multiple orgasms uh, are possible, uh, but they have three typical patterns of response. And these are the three typical patterns, A, B, and C. Um, as you can see, she, this individual had two orgasms. Uh, it's a fairly quick buildup to the point of orgasm and then a resolution. Or they don't have any orgasm at all. They just, I don't know. Anyway, those are the three typical patterns as far as females are concerned. For males, it's uh, always about the same game, always about the same way. In many situations in nature, the males have fe and females of the species are very much different in size as well as structure. In most vertebrates, the uh, male is larger because he, he must battle other uh, males for the right to reproduce. Another definition of sexual dimorphism is that uh, the male gamete is abundant, small, and cheap, while the female gamete is large, rare, and expensive. And for that reason, we could say that uh, females are worth a lot more than males are because the male, uh, a male could, could uh, uh, impregnate uh, any number of females, but each female is worth one child. Uh, males are worth, don't have to be worth anything at all. Because of the low cost of producing sperm, males can easily gather enough nutrients and energy to impregnate millions of women. Whether males are selective or not, the odds are that they will have some offspring that survive. Females, on the other hand, have to be more selective. Now, there's a reason why I put J-Lo's picture uh, when we're talking about selecting mates, because this has been an ongoing process uh, for her uh, throughout most of her life. Um, she dated Ben Affleck. She dated P. Diddy, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, she, uh, she was engaged to Ben Affleck and, uh, for a while, uh, but she had already been married twice. I don't think she was married to P. Diddy. She was just his girlfriend. Females that carefully uh, nurture their costly eggs are more likely to have offspring that survive to be, uh, to be the next generation. Thus, females must mate very carefully. Males that carry many beneficial genes are more likely to provide the female's offspring with favorable genes. But how does a woman do this? The female must closely observe the appearance and the behavior of the male. A vigorous, healthy male is more likely to carry good genes than an unhealthy one. Thus, courtship is a period when the female assesses the genetic makeup of a male to judge the suitability as a mate. This is her first husband. Uh, I can't remember. Uh, Oyani Noah was his name. He was, a, he was an actor and a dancer. And, of course, he was a dancer, so he's in fairly good shape. This is her second husband. Her second husband uh, was named Judd. Chris Judd was his name. He was an Australian football, uh, Australian rules football player, so he was in pretty good physical condition. Her third husband and the individual that she reper reproduced with was Mark Anthony. As you can see, he's shorter than she is. Uh, he was a Puerto Rican singer. Uh, I th don't think he was Puerto Rican, but Mark Anthony was Puerto Rican. He's Australian, and I don't know what nationality Noah is. She is currently dating uh, A-Rod. Uh, Alex Rodriguez uh, used to play baseball. Uh, she's too old to reproduce. Well, she's probably uh, she's probably too old to reproduce. She's 51 years old now, but she is uh, in a uh, extended relationship with uh, with Alex Rodriguez. They've been dating for three years now. You you wonder why in the world do I care about J Lo? I was just you know it's just really kind of curious that she's really picky when it comes to males. And she seems to always select um, the cream of the crop, I guess. I, except, I guess you could say, Mark Anthony. Mark Anthony was her friend. It was her friend. And she claimed that she broke her heart. Uh, ben Affleck broke her heart. And so she, she uh, married uh, Mark Anthony. 
anyway, um, you can look at this in a lot of different ways. But she she seems to be a very selective individual, and she seems to go for um, alpha males, uh, males who are at the top of their form. Chris Judd was uh, uh, the best Australian football players to, player two years in a row. Uh, and she got married in Australia, you can see. Those are eucalyptus trees. Anyway, uh, I don't have an obsession with with uh, with uh, J Lo. I just found it really curious that this lady was able to uh, be so selective with uh, with her mate selection. There are four mating strategies that are used in the animal kingdom kingdom to ensure offspring survival. And the first one is promiscuity, and they, I, these are, are prostitutes, and that's the reason I have them a picture of them. Uh, females will mate with more than one male or as many as they can in any mating season. Uh, this will ensure that the male with the most attributes going for him is more likely to be the sire, and this is known as promiscuity. Now, uh, this is the way dogs do it. Uh, so a female, when she comes into heat, uh, she will select the first mate, mate that she uh, she has intercourse with then she'll have uh, intercourse with uh, with all the male dogs uh, that have uh, that she's attracted um, and she has puppies by whoever whoever you know it's it's a, it's a kind of a toss up at that at that point but they're the ones that won the fights uh, males will fight uh, for reproductive rights uh, and the one that wins gets to go first. Usually that's the way it works. It's the same way in uh, with chimpanzees. Uh, chimpanzees, uh, the female, the, the males will try to chase each other off and, and uh, when she's in heat. But she'll have sex with all of the, uh, all of the males. And I guess the one with the, the most sperm is the one that uh, potentially is the one that she reproduces with. Polygyny, uh, also known as polygamy, is where the male maintains a harem of females and he will exclusively mate, uh, that he will exclusively mate with. This is a man who has married four females. This is him right here. And that's his new wife. That's one of his old wives. And that's his oldest wife. I think that's the way it works. So this is uh, also practiced among humans in many parts of the world. Uh, it's most ungulates made in this fashion, as do gorillas and elephant seals. They maintain harems. Uh, polyandry is uh, rarer than polygyny, uh, but is uh, still known to occur. In polyandry, uh, one woman mates with more than one man, but th those men uh, can only mate with a single female. This is practiced in Tibet. Uh, these two guys are brothers, and that is the, the wife uh, she's probably not exactly sure whether uh, one child belongs, whether this child belongs to him or him, uh, and it really doesn't matter. This is the way they do it in, in Tibet. Okay. <clears throat> Oops, I'm sorry. Monogamy is the uh, most prevalent mating method among humans. Uh, in monogamy, a pair will form a mating pair where exclusive access is maintained between both the male and the female. This seems to be the best manner in which a woman can gain resources from the male uh, when he must provide for his children to ensure that they survive. Sexual selection takes place when the female selects the male that uh, they wish to mate with. Sexual selection among birds is the most garish of all creatures. Uh, in order to attract a female, a, a male will weigh himself uh, down with impossible structures such as a peacock's tail, and uh, the whole reason he has that tail is to attract females. Some species participate in intricate mating rituals during courting that they are not only garish, that are not only garish, but call attention to themselves from predators. Almost all male birds have intricate songs that they sing in the spring during mating uh, to attract a female. In some species, courting is extensive. Among large cats, uh, many vigor uh, only vigorous exercise uh, over several days will bring the female to ovulation. Uh, cheetah are that way. Cheetahs uh, uh, usually a brother pair will uh, will 
chase a female and they will chase her. They won't allow her to, to slow down. She has to keep running and she will do that until she uh, ovulates and then she will have uh, intercourse with uh, both of the, the males uh, who are usually brothers and uh, that's the only way that they can reproduce. The Wadabi males of Niger uh, trying to charm females with eye movements and makeup. This is what the Wadabi look like. I'm going to show you a uh, a video right now dealing with the Wadabi. And this is how the men sing and sway to gain attention. They flutter their cheeks, cross and roll their eyes and grin. Whites of eyes and teeth are considered particularly beautiful. A man who can roll one eye and grin at the same time is considered especially desirable. The Garawal bring two different Wadobi lineages together, allowing each clan to propagate. Parents arrange first marriages at birth, and only cousins of the same lineage may marry. After that, they may seek a partner from another lineage. Moreube works his charm on Mary Amor. It appears to be working. The young wife decides she will allow him to steal her from her husband. I'm with a husband that I don't like, and when I saw More Ube, he was the best. He was better than any of the others, so that's why I agreed to marry him and go home with him. A Wadabi woman can't be taken against her will. Though what More Ube is about to do in the name of love can still have fatal consequences. If they get caught en route, then the husband has the right to require her to come back. If she disagrees, doesn't want to go back, there can often be a fight, and it can be uh, to the death. No Ube must plan carefully to steal his new wife and not lose his life. I go to see the girl, and I explain to her that I want her. And if she says that she wants me, then I look for her husband. If he doesn't see me, I sneak up on the ground. If she accepts, I say, come and look around. If I hear somebody coming, I hide. The moment of truth arrives. Under cover of darkness, Mo Ube heads toward Mary Moore's camp not knowing if he will be greeted by her husband's sword. The ideal is if she makes it all the way to the new husband's house without being caught, and then she has the full right to stay. The new day will reveal whether More Ube's dangerous gamble pays off. The Wadabi are nomadic. They travel the desert and its fringes in extended family groups. This Gera wall is an opportunity to mix between those groups and widen the gene pool for each clan. The men can have many wives, but when a Wadabi woman becomes pregnant, she will return to her mother's home, where she will remain for three or four years. During that time, she must not see or speak with her husband, and he is free to gather more wives. It is early morning, the day after the Garawa. Mo Reube returns from his quest. Last night, the game of love went his way. When he snuck into Mary Amor's camp, fate or good fortune were on his side. Her husband was not there. Okay. Uh, so that's the way the Wadabi do it. Uh, whoops, wait a minute. <laughs> what in the world is happening? 
Okay. Uh, let's see. Let's see how the Maasai attract uh, uh, mates. Uh, kind of interesting. Okay, one of the things you should have noticed was uh, some of the individuals were, were jumping, well, one individual was jumping with that uh, hat on. Uh, that is a lion's mane, uh, and the reason he was able to, to jump with that was because he had killed a lion. Uh, if you have killed a lion, of course, you can put that thing on your head. Now, the idea is that um, the individual that can jump the highest is considered the most uh, uh, attractive uh, of the males. And so that's what they were doing. They were having a jumping contest. And of course, the guy with the, uh, the lion's mane uh, is, is a step ahead of everybody else because he has killed a lion and, uh, and made a, uh, a hat out of the lion's mane. Uh, and that's how the Maasai choose their mates. Wadabi, of course, has to do with how pretty they are and whether they can move their eyes independently uh, and how beautiful their teeth are, as weird as that is. And this is what uh, Wadabi women look like. If I can get this thing to work, I can't. Okay. Wadabi women are up in the left-hand corner and uh, the Maasai women are on the, on the right, uh, on the bottom. Uh, and, and you may have seen those. They weren't really supposed to photograph the women. Uh, which was kind of kind of a curiosity, uh, but they weren't supposed to photograph them. Uh, but you saw them uh, a little bit anyway. Uh, the Wadabis, of course, are a little bit different. Both the Maasai and the Wadabi are Muslim. Uh, sexual differentiation takes place among most uh, humans uh, while still in the womb. Uh, the sperm carries uh, either carries a male or female chromosome. All over are female. So if it were up to females, all babies would be female babies because that is the only chromosome that they produce. Uh, thus, males are a heterogametic uh, sex because of the two different chromosomes, X or Y, while females are homogametic, uh, they only have X's, uh, X chromosomes. Very early in the development, the gonads are not differentiated, and this is, of course, known as indifferent. Uh, gonads at this stage. In mammals, the uh, Y chromosome contains an SRY gene uh, that is responsible for the development of the testes. Uh, the SRY gene is really kind of interesting because in other mammals, uh, other than humans, it is spelled S, uh, lowercase r, lowercase y, but in humans, they're all capital letters. If the individual has a Y chromosome, the cells of the indifferent uh, gonads begin uh, making uh, SRY protein. The SRY protein causes the core of the cells to proliferate or, uh, over the outer layer of the cells and the gonad becomes a testis.
and that's what males look like. Just kidding, not all males look like that. Anyway. If the individual has no Y chromosome, no uh, SRY protein is produced, and the indifferent gonads form with the outer layer dominant and the inner core is inhibited. As the fetus begins to form, they develop two ducts that connect the indifferent gonads to the cell wall, the Wolfian duct and the Mullerian duct. duct. If bathed in testosterone from the testes, the Wolfian duct will develop, if not, the Mullerian duct will develop. If SRY protein is release, released by the Y chromosome, the gonads become testis, testes and bathe the area in testosterone. The Wolfian duct develops into the vas deferens, the epididymis, and the seminal vesicle. The Mullerian duct disappears. That is, if they are a male. Mullerian duct disappears. Wolfian duct becomes uh, some of the sexual uh, reproductive areas of the male. The genital tubercle uh, becomes a penis, and the genital fold becomes a scrotum. If both the chromosomes are X's, the gonads uh, become ovaries. The Mullerian duct develops into the fallopian tubes, the uterus, and the inner vagina, and the Wolfian duct disappears. The genital tubercle becomes a clitoris, and the genital fold becomes the labia majora and labia minora. So if, it, uh, if it's a female, the labia majora and the labia minora uh, are developed, and those, those uh, uh, same structures in the male becomes the scrotum. Testosterone from the testes releases a hormone called anti-mullerian hormone that shrinks the mullerian duct. It causes tissue around the urethra to form a prostate gland. It causes epithelial tissue around the urethra to form a scrotum and penis. The epithelial uh, cells have 5-alpha reductase, which converts uh, testosterone to dihydrotestosterone, which allows masculinization. If the sperm uh, or ova do not have a uh, sex chromosome, the individual will have only one X chromosome. Uh, this individual has Turner syndrome, and it will, she will be a female. Uh, she'll have short stature and not develop secondary sexual characteristics. Uh, Linda Hunt is a, uh, has Turner syndrome. Uh, she's on uh, NCIS, NCIS uh, Los Angeles. I think she's still on in, in CIS. She's a really good actress. Anyway, she has Turner syndrome, and that's the reason she is so short. Uh, the, these are sisters. Uh, as you can see, one, uh, this is when they were younger. I can't get my arrow to work. Wait a minute. Uh, can't get my arrow to work. Anyway, these are sisters, and as you can see, one of them is much shorter than the other, and one of them has no uh, secondary sexual characteristics. And she is the one with Turner syndrome, and her sister doesn't doesn't have it. These are actually two different individuals. They're not the same one, same family. These are two different families with one daughter with Turner syndrome, and the other one doesn't have Turner syndrome. If the female fetus is exposed to androgens in the uterus, uh, she might develop congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Uh, the overactive adrenal glands will produce more androgen and cause genitalia that appears as either an undersized penis or an oversized uh, clitoris. And, of course, uh, in this case, uh, she is a female. Uh, since the androgen receptor is on the X chromosome, if an XY individual has a defective androgen receptor, they will not be sensitive to andro and adrenergic hormones. These individuals are referred to as androgen insensitive. These individuals will develop external female genitalia and develop all secondary female sexual characteristics except for menarche, and they will have a shallow vagina. I'm going to show you pictures of naked uh, uh, females. These are females who, uh, who are androgen insensitive, and there they are. And this Simenya, Simenya is one of these individuals. That's why she, she is actually a she, uh, but she... Um, has a lot of testosterone that she has developed, as weird as that is. And there are three examples on the left. And of course, Simenya is a runner for South Africa. 
Uh, there's a group of males in the Dominican Republic whose 5-alpha reductase, uh, which converts your testosterone to dihydrotestosterone, which allows the penis and scrotum to form, is mutated. So their 5-alpha reductase is mutated. Despite the fact that the individual has an XY chromosomal structure, the lack of 5-alpha reductase does not form a penis. The area that looks like a vagina has no vaginal opening. Because they do, do have testes with puberty, their bodies are bathed in testosterone and their penis develops, their hips narrow, and their build turns obviously masculine. These individuals who were raised and acted like females suddenly be begin looking and acting like males. Most of them will become males, but some of them will choose to become female or stay, stay female. And here are pictures of, I think it's the same individual. Uh, there they are. At 18 months, you can see that they look like a female up through age 12. And at age 12, uh, they develop uh, testes, and the testes will uh, make them into a male. They will bathe them in male, and they will become male. And here's a picture of an individual that chose to stay female, even though that she has um, breasts and her her hips are very similar to a female. She uh, is, has a, a penis and a, and a scrotum. And here's an individual that also chose to be a female. But as, uh, of course, as she changed, uh, she was bathed in, uh, in testosterone. And now it looks like she's on steroids, which in essence she is. She's actually, and as you can see, she's... Um, she has the musculature of a male, but she is uh, looks more like a female. Well, she chose to, act, to look like a female. Here's an individual. The individual on the left is an individual that's Ravidoches. Ravidoches means eggs at 12 is what it means. There is the individual. Uh, she looked like, look like a female, and there's what the individual looks like as, a, as they uh, developed later on. They, he uh, grew uh, testicles and uh, a penis, and he decided, decided to be a, a male, as weird as that is. Anyway, so there are some strange mutations out there. Turner syndrome, um, where the individual is, is insensitive to androgen, uh, and also the, uh, the guava doches. Uh, the individuals <clears throat> who do not develop... Um, who, who don't start developing as males until they're 12 years old. And that is, should be the end of the, yeah, that's the end of the chapter. Okay, so uh, that's it. Sorry about all the nudity. I thought you might be interested in uh, what these individuals actually look like. I mean, we could talk about them, uh, but unless you can actually see pictures of what we're talking about, uh, then you don't really understand what's going on. Okay, that is the end of chapter 12. Next week we will tackle chapter 13. And I'll see you next week. Uh, next week is what? The 10th week? Is that right? Yeah, next, next week is the 10th week.